According to police and other sources in Beirut, Charlie Glass, as he's known to his friends, gave his captors the slip while they were asleep. He climbed out of a 10th floor window and down an outside staircase. He then took a taxi from the middle of the Shiite southern suburbs where he was being held to Beirut's Summerlands Hotel, a lush seafront establishment about two miles away. Mr. Glass, bearded, apparently fit and wearing the same blue tracksuit he was wearing when he was kidnapped two months ago, walked into the lobby and told the receptionist, I need a place to hide. I need a force to protect me. For some, there has been no escape, no rescue, no release. And for a whole country, there is only a kind of captivity, no way out of the bondage imposed by its history. I will not forget Lebanon, but all I have left of it now are the souvenirs I keep around me like talismans, reminders of times, good and bad, in Lebanon's life and mine. We all lived on a precipice, and every moment was precious. It was so easy to fall in love then, with people and places, to make friends for life, to make bonds that could not be broken. I was kidnapped in Lebanon in the summer of 1987. After 62 days, I escaped. But the kidnapping was only one small part of a long experience of a country I had grown close to. I had lived there, I studied there, I worked there. My grandmother was born there, and she had already given me a fondness for it before I first went there in the summer of 1972. I was 21 years old. I had no idea then I would stay so long, no notion that I would become a journalist, that I would witness the beginning of a war which is yet to end, that my friends would be killed, that the time would come when I couldn't return. In a sense, I've grown up in Lebanon, if I've grown up at all. It is hard for me to remember all that happened there, all the suffering, all the dead, all the decent people made refugees, without feeling, in some small way, I lost Lebanon too. In its place, there are only the memories. And if my impressions do not add up to a sensible history, that is because Lebanon makes no sense and is a mystery to everyone who loves it. If I could, I would go back. The best I can do is watch it from afar and try to help others to understand the people who have had to endure battles, massacres, and invasions, and still cling to the hope that someday there will be an end to their nightmare. This was once the heart, the vibrant physical center of a Mediterranean capital. More than half a century ago, the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran wrote as though he foresaw what Lebanon would do to itself. Pity the nation that is full of beliefs and empty of religion. Pity the nation that raises not its voice save when it walks in a funeral, boasts not except among its ruins. Pity the nation divided into fragments, each fragment deeming itself a nation. All that remains now are the fragments of a country that was once so generous, once so alive. I knew these deserted streets as marketplaces, the banks, the trading offices, the coffee houses and restaurants. They are all gone now, all gone, all empty, abandoned in the center of a city, divided against itself. You should have seen it before, before it was destroyed, when the nightmare was still a dream. Yeah. 
Lebanon, sitting at the crossroads of Asia, Europe, and Africa, suddenly seemed to be the center of the world, and Los Angeles, which had until then been the center of my world, receded to the edges where it remains to this day. The old Beirut was alive with color, a cosmopolitan babel of languages, of bargaining, of Christian mixing with Muslim, of Occident meeting Orient, of humor and pleasure. I had never seen anything like it. Most people in Lebanon seem to speak three languages, Arabic, French, and English. There was always discussion. I could sit for hours every day, drinking coffee or beer, and talk about philosophy, movies, books, and most of all, about politics. Arab politics, world politics. People cared about ideas, and there was always the time to talk. It was said that no one came from Beirut, Everyone came to it. Every Lebanese had his roots in a village somewhere. Downtown in the souks, people wearing the costumes of the Druze villager mixed easily with the Shiite peasant and the Armenian shopkeeper. It was so easy to be a foreigner in Beirut. In a way, everybody was a foreigner. At the American University, where I was a graduate student in philosophy, I met students from nearly every country in the world. We were all young, all displaced. I made friends for life with Lebanese, with foreigners like myself, with foreigners very unlike myself. One was Rashid Hamid. Today he lives in New York, now an American citizen. He is a Palestinian refugee. We met at the university and regularly argued politics over cups of Turkish coffee. Two students bridging gaps between two worlds. Rashid taught me about life in a refugee camp, never knowing when Israeli warplanes might strike. I see planes in the air. The Israelis are coming to the aid. I saw two raids in the, between, uh, in the, like around 1972 I saw two raids. One of them was actually, I saw ditches in the ground, water coming out from rockets, from Israeli planes. There were, in one building, there were 15 people, women, children, all civilians, you know, all killed. I saw blood around. When I arrived, it was over, they were already taken to hospitals, to the morgue or to be uh, helped or whatever. After a raid, people searched through the rubble to find their dead and their wounded. It was a ritual reenacted hundreds of times. Then they tried to rebuild. I remember visiting Rashid's family. He was one of nine children after one air raid on the Ain al Helawi camp where they lived. His little brother showed me a huge crater where their school had been. And I understood what Rashid had meant the first time I met him, and I asked him about Palestinian terrorism. He didn't approve of it, but he told me, my life is a form of terror. <laughs> <laughs> 